Zulu Wars was a clash between the might of the British Empire with the African Zulu Kingdom in 1879. This podcast will discuss how Sir Henry Bartle Freer was appointed High Commissioner for South Africa, tasked with a mission to bring the various African kingdoms, tribal areas and Boer republics under British rule. You'll hear how he issued an ultimatum to the Zulu King Ketchwayo on the 11th of December 1878. When demands proved impossible to comply with, war was declared incredibly all without the backing of the British government. We discuss battles such as the stunning Zulu victory at Idenzumwana and the near collapse of the garrison at Rook's Drift. But at the end, the British triumphed. The Zulu nation was no longer independent, but part of the British Empire. By 1870, the British Empire had colonies scattered across South Africa, sharing borders with various African kingdoms, tribal states throughout the region. They were surrounded by Boer settlements, Zulus and other indigenous tribes. The best policy it was decided was one of expansion. The Boer Cape Colony formed after the Dutch ceded Cape Town to the British after the Treaty of 1814 expanded substantially throughout the 1800s. By the 4th of May 1843, the British were able to annex the former Boer Republic of Natal, making it a British colony. In 1867 came a discovery that would change the course of African history forever. By Northwest of Cape Town, diamonds were discovered in Kimberley, bringing about a diamond rush that expanded the settlement into a booming town of 50,000 inhabitants within five years. The attention of the British was drawn as well. In 1870, the British annexed West Griqualand, where diamonds were first discovered. The isolation that the Boers had enjoyed in the interior of the country had changed forever. The Secretary of State for the colonies at the time was, was Lord Carnarvon. He looked to the scheme that worked to create a federation such as used in Canada in 1867 and thought it was perfect for organising South Africa. In 1874, he approached the Orange Free State and the Transvaal, both Boer states, with an offer. A federation between the various Boer and British colonies throughout the region. However, the Boers quickly refused the plan. It would have provided a large amount of cheap labour for the British farms, plantation and mines, and had the British white minority ruling over the black majority an unacceptable position for the Boers. Lord Carnarvon made Sir Bartle Freer the High Commissioner for South Africa in 1877. Freer's job was worked towards the Federation plan supported by Canava, for which he would be appointed the first British Governor of the New Dominion. As such, he went into South Africa to deal with the main obstacles to the plan, the Transvaal Republic and the Kingdom of Zululand. His first act as High Commissioner was to exaggerate the incidents against the Zulus in order to build his own case. If you check out episode one, we discuss the Boer Wars in detail there. Please look in the links in the story notes to find more. British Secretary for Native Affairs in Natal, Sir Phileas Stepstone, annexed the Transvaal Republic in 1777 using a special warrant. This wasn't pleasing to the Transvaal Boers, but seeing as they were wedged between the British and Zulus, they had very little choice. They feared if they fought the British annexation, King Ketsweo and the Zulus would take advantage of the opportunity and attack. 
however, the successive British annexations still created a feeling of unease throughout the Boer republics. Shepstone was worried about the threat of the Zulu army. They posed a danger to Natal. They had acquired old muskets and other out-of-date firearms and were preparing for what lay ahead. As British Governor of Natal and Administrator of the Transvaal, it was his duty to protect these former Boer lands and he directly involved himself deeply in the Zulu border dispute. Boer representations and diplomatic manoeuvrings from Paul Kruger continued to build the pressure. Zulu paramilitary actions began to occur on both sides of the Transvaal Natal border and Shepstone placed the blame squarely on, Ke- on King Ketchwaya. He described him as being in defiant mood, permitting such outrages to occur. Bishop John William Colenza was advocated for those native Africans in Natal and Zulu who had been treated unfairly by the colonial regime. He found himself one of the few defenders of King Ketchwaya. In 1874, he represented Nangbelewi, the king of Hubi and the Ubi tribes, in representation with Lord Carnarvon. The previous leader, the Babeli, had falsely been accused of rebellion, placed through a charade of a trial, and imprisoned on Reuben Island. This defence ended up restraining Colenso from the colonial regime in Natal, as his opposition was not taken well by Shepstone. Colenso championed the cause of the Zulus against the Boer oppression because he had concerned about the amount of misleading information Shepstone was passing to the colonial secretary in London. He spoke out against Bart or Freer's claims that the Zulus were a threat. He points out the dark racist foundations the colonial regime in Natal was based upon, which led him to being seen as enemy by the colonists. And did not want a war with the Zulus, and Prime Minister Disraeli's Tory administration was strongly opposed to it. Sir Michael Hicks Beach, who replaced Carnarvon as Secretary of State for the colonies in November 1878, wrote, quote, Matters in Eastern Europe and India were so serious an aspect that we cannot have a Zulu war in addition to other great and two possible troubles. End quote. However, Sabato Freya had already been in action to this point. His mission was to create a confederation of South African states and his plan was well underway. He knew the powerful kingdoms of the Zulus were opposed to the plan of the confederation and was receptive of Shepstone's case that King Ketchwayo's army posed a threat to the peace of the region. Despite the reluctance of the British government, Freer proposed an ultimatum to Ketchwayo in December 1878. He demanded that the Zulu army has been completely disbanded and they accept British, British residence. Essentially, Ketchwayo would give up his throne and submit to British rule. The Zulus found this entirely unacceptable. The first king of the Zulus was Shaka. Through war and conquest, he built a small tribe into a mighty Zulu kingdom. By 1825, that kingdom encompassed nearly 12,000 square miles. In 1828, Shaka was assassinated by one of his half-brothers in Dunos, and he took over as king. By the 1830s, the Zulus were beginning to get into conflict with the migrating Boers, and Diangi attempted to take action. However, in 1838, he suffered a crushing defeat by a group of 174 tracker settlers at the Battle of Bruv River. Though his half-brother took 17,000 followers to aid the Boers, Diangi was assassinated and Mampanda took over as king of the Zulu Empire. In 1839, the Boer Republics of Natale was formed by the Boer Volk trackers and under the lead of Pretorius. South of the Tugela and West Port of Natal, it was placed directly between Zulu and the British. Mapambi and Pretorius kept peaceful relationships. However, in 1842, 
the British and the Boers went to war, ended with the British annexing the area. The Pandey then shifted his alliance to the British, keeping on good peace terms. The next year, Mapandi began purging those he perceived as distance from within his kingdom. Many people died and refugees began flooding into neighbouring areas by the thousand, including into British-controlled Natal. Many of them brought their cattle with them, the main measure of wealth in Zululand. Mapandi began ordering raids of the surrounding areas up to the full invasion of Swaziland in 1852. However, his British allies were unable to pressure him from withdrawing. At this time, a conflict was breaking out between the Panda's sons, Ketchweber and Muzalzi. The conflict culminated the Battle of Nodamdaski in 1856, which left Ketchweber the clear heir to the throne. He began slowly to observe power from his father for the next 20 years on his way to replacing him as king when Mampandi finally died. In 1861, yet another son of Mapambi, Umtongo, fled to the Utrecht region. Kichweo put together an army and pursued him. The Boers claimed later that Kichweo offered the farmers a re- the region of land along the border as long as they surrounded Umtongo. The Boers agreed, given the condition that Atungo's life be spared, and in 1861 they signed a deal with Mapandi to transfer the strip of land running from Rourke's Drift on the Buffalo down to a point on the Pogongla River. The boundary was officially marked off in 1864, but the very next year Atungo fled back into Natal. Kechweo feared Atungo's supplemented him, just as Mapambi had supplemented Danangi and worried that he lost his part of the bargain. Thus he removed the beacon and claimed the land ceded to Lindenburg by the Swazis. They claimed that the Swazis were vassals of the Zulu state and therefore did not have the rights to give up territory. Ketchweo placed an army under his command as well as a Boer commander commando and the Paul Kruger at the border to defend it and quickly took back control of the land north of Pogola. The Zulus also questioned the validity of the documents concerning a strip of land bordered Utrecht. That debate continued through to 1869 when the Lieutenant Governor of Natal, Sir William Keat, came into arborition. All attempts to settle these disagreements, however, met with failure. While Ketchweo did allow certain European missionaries to enter Zululand, he was opposed to their activities and efforts. He did not harm or persecute the missionaries. It was the converts who suffered his wrath, with several of them killed. The missionaries served as a source of hostile reports. While Ketswayo continued to keep up peaceful relationships with the Natal colonists, numerous Zulus of various rival factions began fleeing into Natal and the surrounding areas. These tense, tense relations served as a political background in 1873 when King Mapandi died and Ketswayo assumed his role as leader of the Zulus. Ketchweo took after his uncle Shaka when it came to leading the Zulus. He attempted to relieve, revive the military might of the Zulus as much as possible, including arming his regiments with muskets and other out-of-date firearms. This was quite the upgrade from the standard armament of the Zulu warrior, which consisted of a thrusting spear and a sheer shield made of cowhide. The marksmanship trained in the Zulu warriors were poor at best and both quantity and quality of the powder and shot were lacking. 